before we start off, um, you might have met or seen uh, Leah Lancaster already. You know, she is she joined us as our insert assistant. Uh, so you're here with me. The person you meet when you okay, so yeah, yeah, we put it into our uh, newsletter that just formally also work, you know, welcome to you with respect. <laughs> Yeah. You know, ladies always get a pen of the most of the So, um, welcome also online. I saw some, you know, you joined us here as well. Uh, let me start, and could you switch the slide, please? Uh, by um, a line that gave me all from respect to the Congan, uh, Songis, and Squamo peoples of this traditional mm -hmm. territory, the university stands, and the Kwangan and the Sun peoples, whose historical relationship with uh, this land and the territory which stays until today. And with this land acknowledgement, I have the great pleasure of introducing Nick McGorgan here, you know, if who has joined us for a couple of weeks and uh, with Brian CFS Big Boards and Globalization Federal. So Nick, welcome to you. You, you told me you've worked with some of the folks here and with, in particular with Emmanuel and, and Simon. So I think it's wonderful that we have you here for a couple of weeks and you know we're tough crowd, you know, we mandated him to give a presentation on the first day he was here, so <laughs> just glad that I got here. And let me uh, introduce Nick McGargan a bit more fully. He's a professor of political geography at Newcastle um, in England, and his research, uh, I think there are two broad areas, I've been, and you can correct me as, as far as I've seen from your CV. The one looks at um, the building of nation states and the government of borders with a particular interest, and we briefly talked about this uh, before this event, uh, the Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan border. You know, you spend a lot of time there and seeing how borders transform and what it means for the people on the ground. Uh, and in general, you know, your research tries to understand human value um, with respect to how borders are being governed. And uh, in a way, we share a certain upbringing, intellectual upbringing in the 90s when we all thought borders would be a matter of the past. Yeah. And with the collapse of communism and you know, there's a unifying border uh, uh, territory in Europe, we would be able to do without these national dividing lines. But clearly, this hasn't materialized and we see actually an expansion of borders and also a more aggressive enforcement of what they mean on the ground. And the other um, piece of your research, but I think that's less what we will hear about today or maybe to a certain degree is the place of religion and church in both of peace and um, conflict re resolution that memories are the key events in terms of what we do to long-term trajectories of um, of understanding between groups or people and, and perhaps the um, But so you can see already the wealth of uh, research research expertise that Nick brings to the center. You can see here also that I think these publications give you a sense of um, issues of nationalism, borders, you know, what Nick had been working on, uh, particularly the 2017 book on nationalism in Central Asia, you know, the border with Pakistan, Kyrgyzstan, and then. The big question, you know, your panel doesn't quite give it away what big questions are, but you know, you will enlighten us uh, what big questions you bring to the center. So Nick, welcome again in Victoria and the floor is all yours. Thank you, thank you very much. It is really delightful to be here and I'm delighted, I'm delighted to be safe. Um, we have a very uh, fastidious risk assessment process at Newcastle University and I had to fill it in before I came. And I had to identify risks, and I said, well, there aren't really any risks. And they sent it back and said, you must look at the Foreign Office website, and we have to Canada. Uh, and it was something about dangerous animals and things like that, you know. I'll try and avoid the part of the campus where the bears are lurking. Um, they said I have to include the risk of mugging when I was here, and that my countermeasure for mugging was that I had to walk confidently and with a sense of purpose. <laughs> to admit, I am a bit of a, of a dawdler and I'm easily distracted, so my request to you while I'm here is if you see me dawdling on <laughs> so, but Trey, it is really delightful to be here. Um, this university reputation, the job of the department and the, the centre, uh, it's a really great reputation. Um, I've, been re I've never met Emmanuel, I've been reading his work for, for a very long time. He's online. Oh, hey, hello, Emmanuel. Um, and so, it's, uh, so many great scholars here, uh, Simon and I've known for, for a very long time. It's truly, truly 
to on to honestly be here. Um, in terms of big questions, I have a new big question to my research just now. Why don't we provide gummy bears at academic seminars in England? I've never seen that before. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so I've already learned a lot. Uh, and I'm, I'm writing a book with the Canadian publisher, uh, McGill Queen. Oh, whatever happened to our borderless world? Uh, and what I'm really interested in, what I want to talk to you today, is the debate about open borders. Should should border controls be abolished? And I I want to examine this debate and propose an alternative way of thinking about it that draws from Christian traditions of anarchist thought. And I'm I'm working through these arguments and going beyond my own fields of expertise in doing this. So I would really appreciate. You're uh, telling you where you think I'm going wrong, or where if there's other avenues you think I could be going down. Uh, I will sketch out in this talk the open borders debate, and look at some problems with it, and then suggest an alternative. Uh, but I want to start by taking you back to the 1990s. Is this working? Mm -hmm. In the 1990s, we didn't have PowerPoint clickers, you see, but this is truly authentic. Um, <laughs> so. Oh, excellent. So, to the 1990s, um, and the end of the Cold War, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Soviet Union, uh, and all of these books were published with titles like The Borderless World or The Extinction of Nation States and the like. Uh, the first reference I can find to a borderless world in academic literature is from the American Journal of Agricultural Economics. In 1972, it wrote an article speculating on the effects on US agriculture of uh, borderless world economy. But it's really in the late 1980s, uh, in advance of NAFTA and the EU, that, uh, that these discussions take off. And a common idea in these books was that economic globalization and the supposed end of the ideological conflict in the world of the Cold War is leading, uh, will make borders less relevant and eventually they'll become completely irrelevant. Uh, and this wasn't just an academic idea, it was also in popular culture. I wonder if any of you can recognise who those fine young men are in that music group on the right. No, no. Good. If it's good, you can't recognise them. It shows you've got a higher level of culture than I have. It's an English uh, pop group called Jesus Jones. And in 1990, <laughs> in 1990 um, they, they, they released a song called Right Here, Right Now. Uh, and one of the lyrics went, the woman on the radio talks about revolution, but it's already passed her by. Bob Dylan used to sing about you, but it feels good to be alive. I was alive right here, right now, watching the world wake up from history. And that was the sort of the theme. It wasn't just an academic work, it was in popular culture. Uh, soon after the overthrow of Ceausescu, they actually went and performed that song in, in Romania. Um, as if the poor Romanians have suffered enough, uh, as it was. So this was the moment. Um, this was the moment we were talking about in the early nineties. But 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 of course, um, of course, um, the borderless world never happened. Uh, I read somewhere there were about ten fences or border walls in in nineteen ninety one. There are now I think getting on for about a hundred. Here's that a recent one put up by the Bulgarians. Uh, with Turkey. There was a war between Bulgaria and Turkey in the Cold War offence. It was pulled down in the 1990s, described as being undemocratic. It was put up again recently uh, in response to uh, the, the fear of, 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 of migrants coming. So this inevitable borderless world didn't happen. Uh, and, and in response to these multiple rematerializations of borders, the energy is moved to the, the open borders debate. And uh, most of this literature comes from North America and the EU, the UK and Australia. Uh, and sort of the animus from this comes from the violence of, of borders recently. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I've made it uh, a tradition when I have significant birthdays to go to interesting borders. And when I turned 40, with a group of friends, we went to um, to Melilla. Melilla is a Spanish coastal territory on North Africa. It's been ruled by Spain for about half a millennium. And I flew with a group of friends, British and Kobe's friends, from Malaga, from UK to Malaga. We took a ferry over to Melilla. We explored, we popped over into Morocco for refreshments. Uh, and in the evening, we sat by the harbour side, eating tapas and drinking Rioja and celebrating. 
celebrating my birthday. And with good friends and good food and good wine and interesting boy, I, I couldn't imagine a, a better way to spend a birthday. But here's the rub. That same night, that same night, 150 migrants from West Africa attempted to scale the border. Uh, and it's uh, it, it's a, a border funded by the EU. Um, it's it's one of the most sort of militarized, secure border offences that the EU has created, uh, and, and they failed. Uh, the thirty they were mostly pushed back by border guards, but the thirty or so who did manage to get in uh, were put in detention centres. So with our wealth and privilege, uh, being UK citizens or having UK visas, we could just one up there and enjoy ourselves and cross the border backwards and forwards. Um, but with their passports, they had to make the, the arduous and dangerous journey across deserts, uh, with people smugglers avoiding armed militias and criminal gangs. When we reached Malia, we were way through. We had the right passports. When they arrived, they had to attempt to get over this terrible border. Moving from the western uh, from the eastern Mediterranean, western Mediterranean to the eastern, the sheer violence of the EU's border controls, I think, was demonstrated in, in this year. In, in July, the Adriana, which was a Russian uh, sh uh, fishing vessel, dangerously overloaded with Syrian and Egyptian Palestinian refugees, was heading from Libya to Italy. And it got into trouble off the Greek coast. And a nearby Greek uh, Troll, border patrol vessel, was there, it was watching it sink. It didn't intervene, it didn't help. Instead, an SOS call was put out, and uh, the May and Queen, the fourth. This is a $175 million luxury yacht owned by the family of a Mexican billionaire. It arrived at the scene, and the, uh, the staff, who were more accustomed to pampering the, um, the guests and joining its onboard swimming pools and jacuzzis and helipads and other luxuries, rescued 104 migrants from the sea, but it's estimated that five to 600 people drowned. And these, these unequal seas demonstrate that, that borders are violent filters. The May and Queen had visited in recent years, visited a number of destinations, Honduras, Sydney, Auckland, and EU destinations like London and Rhodes and Tallinn. The passengers on the Adriana were also trying to get into the EU, but they, but for them, because they didn't have the wealth, they couldn't get in legally. For the multinational rich, the Mediterranean was their playground. But for the poor, the border ocean was their, their graveyard. And the International Organization for Migration uh, reported in 2017 that they reckon 33,000 migrants had died at sea trying to reach European shores between 2000 and 2017. Making the EU's southern border, they said, the world's by far the world's deadliest border. And, and so it, it, it's from the, the, the violence, the inequalities that were given in those two examples that much of the open borders debate has, has emerged. Here's a number of the key books published in, in recent years. Uh, and, and these arguments tend to, uh, these books tend to make four different arguments for open borders or for no borders, as some of you would phrase it. The third of these is economic. Nigel Harris, in his book, Thinking the Unthinkable, talks about the right to work, uh, which can only be enjoyed by moving. This is intrinsically said to the eradication of poverty to be able to move to work. Insofar as the world refuses to allow people to move freely, it chains people into poverty. When the World Bank made its first report on China in 1980, it criticised internal migration controls as chaining people into poverty. And much of China's economic boom has been facilitated by the ending of those migration controls so people can move to work within China. Ronald Skeldon, the geographer, says migration is development. It's much more efficient than foreign aid transfers or government loans. Money doesn't get lost in corrupt bureaucracies. It goes to people who need it and, and use it. And, and the examples I gave from the Mediterranean, these were people who wanted to move to work, young, energetic, fit, uh, hardworking. So that's the first argument for open borders economic. The second is moral. Some moral and ethical, some people reject the economic argument about the value of immigration. This puts a price on people. And their focus is on 
the violence and inequality supporters. So Harold Bader, again on that list up there, says this, international borders have become deadly barriers that are on a par with war, genocide, and major ep epidemics, and natural disasters in the number of fatalities they produce. If we regard these other disasters as things we should do something about, well, we can easily do something about migration control. We can end them and you end these deaths. Alex Saber writes, uh, from the liberal tradition of political philosophy, border controls are amongst the most significant causes of global inequalities. My experiences in Medina demonstrate that, and therefore should be abolished. So for two reasons, I hate it. They uh, strongly scare against immigration controls is that they, they impose harsh suffering on migrants and undermine a long list of human rights, the right not to be tortured, to be subjected to degrading, treatment to be arrested, to have a uh, family white life broken, etc. And Michael Dummett uh, makes an argument which is seen by many others that, that border controls are essentially racist. So in 1948, um, I was saying with Simon and, and Simon's wife would say that her, her mother was a British citizen. It's a Canadian. In 1948, he written passed a law that all citizens of the Commonwealth were British citizens. Anyone could come to Britain. But this changed. My like, phrase in 1962, the Conservative government introduced a new immigration bill, which was essentially racist, excluding immigration from, uh, uh, from Africa and Asia. Um, the Labour Party opposed it, and on coming to power, they actually strengthened it. And a former Labour cabinet minister said, we realised it was going to be a vote loser. We had to be seen to act up on migration. We've seen this cycle. Uh, and this is, 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 is we've seen this in the United States, we've seen this in Canada. Who could get to Manila? Who couldn't get in? With an accident of birth. Why is that fair? That's the second set of arguments against uh, four open borders, uh, moral arguments. The third historical. This is a scene, uh, an argument that's made in, in most of these forms. Migration has always been a part of human activity, searching for new hunting grounds, pastures, sources of food, means of work and shelter. But it's only the rise of the modern nation state that has changed that. So the assassin uh, wrote a, a very interesting book looking at the history of migration as being cyclical. A significant percentage, a third of migrants who went to the United States in the, in the, in the 19th century actually returned. They went, earned money, and took it home. And what migration controls do is if migration becomes illegalized and made hard, people don't want to leave because they think I'm not going to be able to get back in. So, um, so migration controls can actually increase long-term migration, uh, which one would expect. That's the third argument, historical. And the fourth is, is practical. That migration controls don't actually work. This is uh, uh, earlier this year, uh, a, a man who was, was, was jailed, if you could advance that slide for me, thank you, in Belgium, for having one of the most uh, significant, actually, human trafficking gangs, which involved in smuggling migrants across the English Channel. And he was he was himself a migrant, Kurdish, he came to London, was given asylum, and he, he procured boats and motors and life jackets from China and Turkey. They were smuggled across, they were transported across Europe, assembled in France, uh, his gang would meet groups of migrants on the uh, on the north coast of France, give them life jackets, show them how to turn the motor, point to the direction to go, you're off. It's incredibly dangerous, incredibly dangerous. You've got a quarter of a million pounds for each cross. So, so, so migration controls don't actually work, they don't stop people migrating, they make it more dangerous, and they uh, they force they, they, they force people into criminality, criminal gangs become stronger, uh, and think of all the money that was lost. You know, if they come over on the ferry, they each pay their pay ferry tickets. Uh, they arrive, they pay taxes. Yeah. So practically, migration controls don't work. So these are um, look. It's not that they don't. They're not going to have to fight. Though, of course, they are very dangerous and very powerful. So, so to sort of conclude these. Uh, uh, Rhys Jones, um, in his 2019 book, uh, Open Borders and Defense of Free Movement, which is a superb book, and it brings together a lot of the leading scholars in this field, scholars and activists, makes the case for moral, uh, the case for open borders. And it's based on five arguments, which I've, I've put on, 
on the screen there. And these are a mixture of moral, of economic, moral, historical, and practical. And they all lead, uh, Rhys Jones says, they will lead to a borderless world of free movement. So this is a brief summary of the open borders case. And to me, it seems very, very compelling. Um, there are objections to it. The best known objections are, um, are, are well summarized within these books. And there are, there are three. Um, from, from the right, we have the idea that migration undermines sovereignty and cohesion. It reduces living standards and it creates unemployment and it makes the welfare state unavoidable. Suella Braverman, she's the British uh, Home Secretary at the moment. Interesting background. Her parents were forced out of Uganda by Idi Amin. Uh, so she's from uh, British South, South Asian heritage. Uh, and she, in, a, in a recent Conservative Party conference speech, she addressed the question of open borders. It's become so significant that it's actually been referenced in these things. And she said open borders is a luxury belief. It's espoused by people in the ivory towers. Yeah. You know, she means mm -hmm. like us. She said, because they will not be threatened by migrants. If migrants come to Britain, they will be cleaning their cars and looking after them and cutting their lawns. These are luxury beliefs they can espouse. That's from the right. From the liberal perspective, um, thinkers like Martha Nussbaum or Onara O'Neill in Britain, liberal political philosophers, argue that Migration controls are necessary for the creation of deliberative democracies. For democracies to work, there needs to be a level of trust who, you know, who is within the community, who is outside the community. And so creating what O'Neill an calls just borders is a necessary task for liberal democracies. And on the left, uh, Slavoj Žižek uh, said, said this, that the greatest hypocrites are those who advocate open borders. Secretly, they know very well this will happen because it would lead to a populist revolt. They play the beautiful soul, which feels superior to the corrupted world, as the only terrain where they can exert their moral superiority. The problem is it's global capitalism that creates an even development. And we need to address that by creating a global commons, which in my youth, he said, was called commons. <laughs> so these, <laughs> these arguments are well known and they are, I think, fairly well rebutted in, in, in Rhys Jones's book there, will rebut most of those very well. But I want to look at five more arguments briefly that I think have not been addressed in the literature, which have become topics uh, that are much more, become more aware of in recent years and they're overlooked in the open borders literature. And the first is a greater awareness of the legacies of settler colonialism. In, in 1998, after Christmas in the Chinese city of Kashgar in Eastern Turkestan, Xinjiang. And I took the bus over from Central Asia and, and I always dreamed of being shopkeeper. When I was a little boy, my favorite game was shopkeeper. And my dream came true in Kashgar. Uh, and I got speaking to a man, it's like, I can speak Uzbek and Kyrgyz, Uyghur is a similar language, he was a Uyghur man, Uyghur Muslim, uh, and he, was, he has a little shop selling electrical goods, and he said, we got talking, to look, I need to go to prayers, Friday prayers, and you look at my shop, so for half an hour, I played shopkeeper, and as thousands of men went to the, the, the one beautiful central mosque in Kashgar. But since 2017, China has launched what it calls this de externification project program. It sees Uyghur Muslims as a separatist and extremist threat. Two million men have been placed in these uh, concentration camps, essentially. They are forced to eat pork. They are forced to express their loyalty to the Chinese Communist Party. While they are in there being re-educated, Han Chinese officials will go and stay with their families, sleeping in the same beds as their wives and children, observing any demonstration of Muslim piety. The women are arrested and the children are put in um, boarding schools. Again, where they are sport to speak only Chinese, forced to eat pork, indoctrinated. It is a uh, cultural genocide. And, and yet, what this has been facilitated by migration. Various parts of the open borders literature will talk about the value of China. Internal migration has created this marvelous economic miracle. What China's done is it's moved millions of Han Chinese to <coughs> East Turkestan, Xinjiang, as they settle colonialism to overwhelm the local population. 
settler colonialism, um, which which needs borders, it, 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 uh, I think is is an argument against open borders. Um, Harris, I mentioned earlier, uh, in his argument that migration has always been part of human history, that we shouldn't stop it, gives one example. He said, uh, in seventy million Europeans migrated to North America. Australia and Africa. It's always been part of human history. Well, we wouldn't have endorsed that settler colonialism, would we? Would we? So I think a greater awareness of settler colonialism problematizes the argument for open borders internationally. Secondly, and related to this, is a greater awareness of the rights of indigenous communities and the challenge to their survival posed by migration. In my, my 2017 book on nationalism in Central Asia. I, uh, in this book, I chart the violence of border controls. Borders are imposed where there were no borders before. Uh, and I, uh, I won't talk about that today. I might be given another talk while I'm here on this. Um, and I, I gave a presentation on this book in different places, uh, and I finished with an argument for open borders. I, 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 in one occasion, someone from New Zealand, and another occasion, someone from Canada said to me, and I finished by saying that people should be able to go and move and live wherever they like. And they said to me, you know, this doesn't take account of the violence done to indigenous communities. Well, you know, it, we, 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 you shouldn't be able to say that. Uh, Nina Carlson's work has looked at new immigrants in Sweden. She looks at how they're placed in indigenous Sami lands and that their uh, integration program reproduces settler colonialism. Um, and she argues that the Sami parliament, this institution we read, doesn't have the right to control secular migration in its territory. It doesn't have, although she doesn't break it in these words, it doesn't have control on migration. It isn't able to force border controls. So strikingly, indigenous sovereignties or peoples are absent from the indexes of almost all the recent books making the case for open borders. Third, uh, the third issue with the uh, open borders literature that become more prevalent in recent years is our awareness of, of the climate crisis. Um, I forget the figures, but under Bolsonaro's rule in Brazil, huge areas of lack of rainforest were, were encouraged, uh, much settler people were encouraged to migrate, to chop down this forest and to develop it. We're increasingly aware of, uh, of, of, of uh, the importance of forests for the long-term health of the climate. Protecting forested land is not, is not compatible with open internal migration. I think Brazil reminds us of that. Fourthly, uh, third is the COVID-19 pandemic, which showed temporary materializations of national, regional, and local borders in previously unimagined ways. Uh, and and, and a, a study compared the success of different states in controlling the first wave of the disease. And this was before we had good understanding of how to treat it, and of course, before vaccines were, uh, were, were, were invented, mainly very dangerous. Uh, and it identified international border controls as one of the key factors in mitigating infections in that early way. Do we really want a world in which we cannot halt certain deadly communicable diseases amongst people or animals or plants by temporarily halting the movement? And uh, finally, finally, the fifth the more recent issue, I think, leads us to question some of the open borders arguments, is the rise of, uh, of Islamic State, or Daesh. It's an example of what we might call actually existing borderlessness. So Daesh aspires to be, uh, to replace the capitalist nation state system with a global borderless community. In June 2014, the day in which its leader, Abu Bakr, Bakr al-Baghdadi proclaimed the establishment of a caliphate, it, it released a 15-minute video called The End of sykes Pico. And this referred to the sykes Pico agreement between Britain and France in the First World War to carve up the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East and draw the boundaries which we basically recognize now. Uh, and it's narrated by a Chilean IS fighter. <coughs> and he opens the address by pointing to a, to a sandburn which he said is the border of Iraq and Shah, Syria. He walks up onto the berm and said, the so-called border of Sykes-Picot, we don't recognize it and we never will recognize it. 
He calls Al Baghdadi the breaker of barriers and adds, God willing, we will break the barrier of Iraq, of Jordan, all the countries, God willing. This is the first barrier that many, many we will break. Uh, and then he takes a tour of the border post they catch it. He shows uh, a map of the border, mocks it, he shows us prisoners working in the border post they catch it. Uh, they retreat from a distance and then blows up the post, presumably killing all the men who are trapped inside. And he finishes by saying, we are not here to fight for an imaginary border of science, Pico, but for the universal dominion of God. Now, this, this matters, I think, for the open borders literature, because the literature often points to existing examples of borderlessness as, a, as stepping stones to what a borderless world could look like. The EU is often the EU. The EU's internal border controls, not goods, external goods, are used as an example of stepping stones. Um, but the day is a reminder that what we might call actually existing borderlessness can be deeply problematic. And that a borderless world isn't necessarily just a peaceful one. Yet, yet this isn't properly reflected on in literature. So the violence and injustice of borders needs dealing with. But I'm not convinced that the open borders literature has grappled with the difficulties grown up in recent years. So what to do about this? I want to suggest an alternative to think about the ethics of borders. And there are two steps I want to make in that. And the first is, and here I'm speaking as a job, but it's terminological. It's a disciplinary attention to terminological precision. Almost the entire literature on the debate about open borders falls prey to significant and frequent category errors in that borders, boundaries, border walls and migration policies are frequently confused or conflated simply as borders. For example, Rich Jones's argument for open borders is pitted as a universal ethic that's rhetorically structured around tangible barricades like the US-Mexico border war, but in its core, it's primarily a critique of racist US migration policies, some of which are bolstered physically and discursively by wars. Uh, political geographers are, are very keen to distinguish between international boundaries and international borders. International boundaries are not lines on a map. They are the invisible vertical planes depicting the horizontal extent of sovereignty between uh, a formal legal sovereignty between states. You can never see or touch an international boundary. It doesn't appear on a map, it's only described legally in terms of the treaty. Boundaries are useful, they actually show responsibility. For example, who picks up, who collects the rubbish, trash from your house? If it's not collected, you ring up the particular local authority designated to doing that and say, come on, pick up this rubbish. Boundaries deliver responsibility. <coughs> uh, a a country procures a certain amount of vaccines and um, for medical statistics, we can know what percentage of the population needs vaccinating in order to protect the general population against that disease. Who actually does those vaccines? <laughs> They just draw up boundaries and say it's your responsibility, you have in this area to make sure 97.3% of the population are vaccinated. So boundaries are very useful. Boundaries tell us responsibility and duties. International borders are different. They are social institutions and practices that are associated with international boundaries, and they may or may not include walls and fences and checkpoints and migration policies and nationalist iconography and discourses. The borders uh, rematerialized, increasing it away from the literal edges of the state. Ms. Jones' work is excellent in showing how the uh, US uh, border controls increasingly police who could access healthcare and education within inside the state, for example, and borders get pushed away from the state. The European Union has a series of agreements with its neighbors. <clears throat> They get access to elements of the single market. They have to enforce EU border controls in their states. The borders get pushed outwards and inwards. So carefully using these distinctions between boundaries and borders allows us to clarify precisely what we are against and what we are for. And to move away from oversimplifications like open borders or borders matter. So the first step. But the second step 
is this. I think it's to identify the essential problem. For me, the problem is not with borders and boundaries per se. Borders and boundaries can enhance human well-being in their absence, and the attempt to erase them can be violent and disastrous. The problem is when we make too much of international boundaries and borders, when we come to see them not as the means to enhance well-being, but as ends in themselves. We go wrong when we regard boundaries as quasi-sacred institutions that must be honoured and defended and protected and revered at all costs. In short, the problem is that the lines around the modern nation-state have become sacralized. We've come to see them as something sacred. And this is a theme in nationalist dis discourse the world over. My, my major work has been on the Central Asia and the Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, the boundary and the violence of new border controls. The picture here is of a village called Jar. It's one, it's a small village, it's one long street. Everyone is ethnically Uzbek. And because Uzbeks practice endogenous marriage, most people are related to each other. There was one mosque, one cemetery, one school. But because this village had the misfortune to have been built in the Soviet times on what was a boundary between two, uh, two states in the Soviet Union, Uzbek and Kyrgyz republics, um, in 1999, suddenly the Uzbek government put this barbed wire fence right through the middle and stopped the movement immediately. Um, and it's extraordinary violence. It was associated with uh, a lot of extraordinary levels of, of, of violence against families, breaking up families, trade routes. Um, lots of people were shot and killed trying to evade these borders and boundaries. And it, I won't talk about much about it now. I might give another talk on that when I'm here. But what's interesting here is that Lanzo Lajorayo is an Uzbek political scientist. He wrote an article in the press at this time, enjoining this, his, his country mates to protect borders. He said it's if a troublemaker or an armed person violates the border, the state shouldn't be called, or don't call for the army. Citizens themselves would rush to the border saying, the state border is my border, and this issue is sacred for me. The sacralization of borders. Similarly, in 2018, President Trump refused to sign a spending bill that the Republican majority in the Senate had passed, unless it included money for his his border wall, you remember he said that Mexico would pay for it, but he wasn't able to rival that. So he said, I need your money. He said this, he said, this wasn't for political purposes, but for our country and for the safety of our communities. It is our sacred obligation to have no choice. Our sacred obligation. And even when the overt language of the sacred or holy is dropped or downplayed, the force of sentiment remains. The populist defense of border controls, I think, Testifies this. William Cavana is a political theologian. He wrote a very interesting book called Migration to the Holy. And, and he said the holy in the age of nationalism has migrated from the church to the state. Uh, just watch some of the remembrance commemorations we'll see in, in, in Britain. I don't know what, what Canada's like in those, but you see the state being revered. The unknown soldier, their memory will live forever. The state, the, the holy has migrated from the church to state in the age of nationalism. It's very good, very interesting analysis. And so he doesn't talk about borders, but I think it is at the border that the state is worshipped most devout. And this is the problem that we face. The state has been sacralized. So the challenge is not to erase boundaries or pretend that we can live well without them. The challenge is to desacralize them. So we can think about them in their proper place. And because the sacred is a theological term, concept, help us with the task of desacralizing boundaries. I want to turn over to modern scholarship that I think is better deal in equipped to deal with that, which is political theology, and in particular the tradition of Christian anarchism. Um, in, in Greek, arche means rule or power. And so anarchism literally means anarchy, against rule, without power. Peter Marshall wrote uh, what seems one of the definitive authoritative histories of anarchism. Uh, and he, he points out that it's Peter Kropok in the very anarchist thinker who, who coined the term Christian anarchism. Uh, and he said that in the Bible, which is Christianity's source material, the, the Political power receives very short shrift. The Hebrew, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, 
invariably portrays this exercise as negative, a long list of corrupt and mendacious Hebrew kings, uh, but particularly in, in the most prophetic denunciation of, um, of the, the pomposity and ridiculousness of Babylonian rulers in the Jewish exile. Nebuchadnezzar, in the sixth century, in the book of Daniel, through Daniel's, uh, Daniel into a, um, a lion's den for refusing to worship the head of state. His friends were thrown into a fiery furnace, refusing to bow down to a golden statue. That is, they refused to accept the state as sacred. In the New Testament, Herr Marshall claims Jesus consistently held political authority up to derision with both the local religious authorities and the Jewish rulers and, and the Roman Empire portrayed negatively. And this critique of, of the violent, self aggrandizing and corrupt religious state power and resistance to it is the basis of anarchist thought. It's American theologian Vernon Eller. Uh, he, he argues that anarchism, Christian anarchism, is the state of being uninterested with or disinterested in or sceptical about the highfalutin claims of any and all artists. Uh, other thinkers adopt a position not so much of being disinterested in, but being opposed to. Jacques Ellul, the French social theorist, um, writes that Christianity inevitably entails a rejection of state power and a fight against it, and is therefore essentially anarchistic. We see the Bible as a source of anarchy, uh, churches being established by Jesus as uh, not as withdrawing from the state, from, from public life, not trying to take over public life, that's the error of the, the American right in the Christian churches there, but as setting up alternative pacifist, anti-nationalist um, communities, which act as by means of persuasion, by the creation of small groups and networks, living out a different thick denouncing forced and oppression and overturning authorities as people at the bottom speak and organize themselves. Uh, and so this, this contrast is important, I think. Christian anarchism is not simply a, a theory, it's a way of life. Uh, some of you may know the writings of Dorothy Day. She's influenced me a great deal. She's a, uh, she was, a, she was a, an atheist who became a, became a Catholic, 1930s American. She was influenced by Kropotkin. And she established Catholic workers' houses. These are houses of hospitality that exist uh, as uh, outside the state. I'll give you an example. In, in 2018, it was the Association of American Geographers Conference was in New Orleans. And rather than stay in the um, sort of the corporate hotels, I, I stayed at the Catholic Workers' House of Hospitality. Interesting place. So I took part, the Bell of the Conference took part in the daily rhythms of reflection, discussion, and peace vigils. Um, and what's striking about this place is they, their speciality is dealing with helping people with homelessness. The New Orleans state, apparently, if, if families were homeless, it would put the men and the women in separate hostels, essentially breaking up families and already traumatized. So what they would do is they would welcome families into their community. They would refuse to have anything to do with the state. They wouldn't pay taxes. They wouldn't take any grants. They wouldn't uh, have any dealings with the state. Uh, and they would welcome these families and help them try to get them back on their feet. So this is essentially Christian anarchism. But to develop a Christian anarchist view of international boundaries and borders, I draw in particular on theologian Walter Wink. He wrote a monumental corpus on the use of arche and arche in the New Testament. Uh, and these are variously translated in the, the Bible as powers and authorities, governments, administrations, thrones, kingdoms, empires. Or in the words of the King James translation, uh, the powers that be, which is an expression we use. He suggests that these include monarchs and realms and administrations and militaries and appointed officials. It involves laws and economies and systems of governance and ideologies and universities. These are all examples of powers and authorities. And, and theologians debate are these to be seen as positive or negative? Should we resist them or work with them? But they agree. That they are all temporal, not eternal, and they are all subordinate to God, and they have no legitimate claims to unconditional allegiance. They are not sacred or divine. This is important. <clears throat> and uh, modern states, so I suggest it's productive to see international boundaries and borders as created by modern states as another case of such powers and authorities. They are under a divine mandate 
to restrain evil and to promote good. Not sacred in themselves, not end in themselves. But how do we judge what is good? Yeah. Uh, here I turn to another discipline of theology, uh, which has a, a radical political edge, black theology. This emerged out of the African-American struggle against slavery and segregation and ongoing racism. Uh, and the core idea is that human beings are created in this biblical idea in Margot Day, in the image of God. Meaning that they all have, all humans have equal dignity and worth and capacity, and therefore are, are worthy of equal respect and access to equal opportunities. Uh, and, and this idea in Margot Day is at the heart of African American resistance writing from uh, Henry Garnet Highland and Frederick Douglass in the 19th century to Martin Luther King Jr. and James Cone in the 20th. Um, Richard Wills wrote a, a definitive account of Martin Luther King's thinking and argued that right from his student essays, everything he did and said, his concept of Imago Dei, even when he didn't use the language, was, was key to King's life. It was the basis of all of his political activism. And extending this, borders and boundaries are thus to be judged on how they recognise the inherent and equal worth of everyone and how they facilitate human flourishing. So this being the case, borders and boundaries of modern states are not to be seen as sacred or eternal. They are simply the recent creations of a modern ideology, nationalism, that will not endure indefinitely. The state sovereignty they delimit is not absolute, and there should be no assumption that a certain person should not be able to cross these borders because they don't have the correct passport. The types of border regimes you see across the world, the closures and defences, the restrictions on movements, the fact of historical geographies in borderline communities, all varied from the force by everyday coercion, by discursive control and lethal violence, they are an exercise of power that exceeds states' mandates because they deform human existence and they mar beings created in Margot Day. It follows there should be multiple dematerializations of borders. It's, and, if, and if not, it is moral to resist the illegitimate exercise of borders controls, even if that means formally breaking state laws. At the same time, states should be recognised as having a limited legitimate mandate to govern justly. It's their duty to administer borders in a way that promote good and restrain evil. Their attempts to create deliberative communities should be recognised as valid but they must do so in ways that promote the flourishing of all people living inside and outside. Knowledge of the precise location of boundaries, what in geography we call delimitation, is necessary for states to undertake a range of activities, allocating responsibility for providing goods and services like trash collection or firefighting, etc. And it follows that, taken more negatively, it's, it is legitimate for police and customs and other border officials to control borders to independent communities by stopping the movement of criminals, of terrorists, of harmful drugs, of people trafficked for sex work. Boundaries are needed, for example, to report the responsibility for, it, for maintaining records of child sex offenders so they can't be employed in public schools, for example. Communities devastated by colonial institutions should be able to prevent and control secular migration to their territories. Environmental protection agencies should be empowered to guard valuable and vulnerable ecosystems against the, in the movement of developers by policing their borders. And poorer urban communities should be able to protect themselves against gentrification. And these measures all require some form of boundary knowledge and border control. So we can envisage border regimes that are more open for the free movement of people than is the case today, but where harmful flows are policed and interdicted. In so doing, the powers that be at the border will fulfil their responsibility of making good places and of treating people well. And so to finish, I have suggested this geographically informed Christian anarchist approach to borders provides a powerful and comprehensive but context-specific way of thinking about the politics and morality and geographies of borders. And it advances the no borders literature in four ways. Firstly, geographically, it, we're looking at terminology. 
where the debate confuses boundaries and borders and migration controls. This disaggregates them and allows greater clarity of analysis. Secondly, again, geographically, it's not ethnocentric. Much of the open borders literature is derived from the focus on, on flows of migration from the global south to North America, the EU, Australia, New Zealand. Thirdly, in terms of anarchism, it moves us away from, obs from on, on obsession of the state that characterizes both pro and anti borders literature. Uh, Sager rights, our imaginations fall frequently under the thrall of state centered ideology. In, in the Anthropocene, where human existence is threatened by our impact on the environment, thinking about states and borders isn't the great way to begin. And finally, I think it, it offers a clear reason for treating people of borders well. The open borders literature is peppered with statements like people matter regardless of race and ethnicity, or migrants are human beings and they should be treated as such. But it's rarely, if ever, unpacked why we treat people, why we should treat people well. For example, my final slide. This is Terence. He's a pigeon who is come to come to uh, he lives in my garden, basically. Well, I regard this as my garden, he regards it as his garden. And what he does is he uh, he enforces migration controls. He doesn't allow other male pigeons to enter our garden. He fights them off. And this allows him to mate with the females and to access our generous welfare state, also known as the bird table we have in the back garden. Now, most mammals, other than us, as birds and insects and fish, do precisely that. They defend their territories in order that their group and progeny may prosper at the expense of others. It's a basic no universal instinct of animal territoriality. It would be bizarre of us to judge it morally. If we're animals who've evolved in the same way, why on earth shouldn't we, as Homo sapiens, also put up fences and borders and do exactly the same? What is it? What is the basis of what the Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor described as our ineradicable sense that human life is to be respected? The Christian answer, and if you say otherwise, is because people are made in the image of God. As King put it, Martin Luther King put it memorably, we are not mere flotsam and jetsam on the river of life, we are a child of God. Because of this, theologian David Atkinson said, every person who crosses our path is a gift to be created as heaven, to be completely honoured and to be given respect. And I would add, crosses not just our path, but crosses our border. And I think this is a more rational and solid basis than the ephemeral declarative statement sentiment that peppers much of the open borders literature. So that's a long talk that I'll leave you there. Would like to say that? Um, I've got some much to talk. Uh, before I start, I want to say that I'm on the same border. Uh, as humans debate, uh, I also think the borders is, uh, is imperative, an ethical imperative. Um, and so I have two, I have one suggestion and another question. One suggestion is, so if you want to avoid uh, quoting uh, the Slovenian person, we quoted it before, uh, an interesting leftist objection to what the borders is going to be in here. But his objection is immigration increases diversities, diversity in societies, especially Western societies. <coughs> diversity leads to uh, lower levels of trust. And this is a controversial statement, but let's plant it. And lower levels of trust mean uh, less support for welfare states and less security measures, right? So I think it's a little bit more okay, thank you. plausible than whatever it is that uh, you was trying to say. Uh, yeah, and so my objection is as follows. So it's a strategy-based objection. So uh, if you want to fight for open borders, if you want to convince people that open borders is, is a good thing, you fighting the ugly button right, in the world today. Uh, I'm sure it's to say it's the case in the UK, it's the case in my uh, two home countries, in French and Polish. Uh, people are going to be very convinced by the fact that you know, open borders is something that we should uh, strive towards. It's our moral compass and so on. And what I'm afraid about is that basically your, your argument here is just a deontological argument. Right? So basically, you say, well, you know, immigrants, illegal immigrants, wherever they come from, you know, they, they are entitled to like uh, basic respect and so on, have a duty you know, to, to, uh, to, to, you know, to welcome them. What's the term use? We should, they should be treated well uh, when they cross the border, right? <laughs> The problem is everyone is a deontologist until the wallet is involved. And this is you know, generally this is generally the problem uh, with, with this debate. So basically, people can say, yeah, sure, we have a duty to, to, to treat immigrants well, but there's only so much we are willing to spend, you know, on them, right? On welcoming them, on, 
on, uh, on accommodating them and, and so on, right? And so that's why you know people are going to say, oh, you know, refugees, yeah, sure, people who feed the war, yeah, okay, we have a duty towards them, but people who just want to work, no. And so this is where I think, uh, this is, I think, a mistake. We should stop arguing for the borders uh, in terms of we have a duty towards immigrants. We should get to the hard, uh, called economic facts. And so the hard uh, called economic facts is that in a world of open borders, if we just open borders right now, if we lifted all sort of economic, uh, you know, uh, immigration restrictions, we would triple to quadruple world GDP, right? Everyone would be three times to four times, even everyone here. We would all be three times to four times richer. Like closed borders are the most, the biggest, most massive economic dead weight mm -hmm. loss, basically, I think, in human history. And, you know, that's, I think, much more convincing. Uh, uh, much more convincing argument than, 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 than any kind of like right or respect based things. It may be like inhuman, it may be cold, it may be like, um, oh, you know, you're just treating immigrants as, you know, not entering themselves and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, if you talk to the, to the uh, what was the what was her name, the Tory that you mentioned? Uh, Suede Brown. Yeah, exactly. I, I work with this, I don't know her. Yeah, you know, if you, if you talk that language to her, she's going to understand that. And so I think there's a strategy to say in the direct that you make. Yeah. Thank you. I it's interesting. I, um, I was listening last night to the 1980 US presidential primary debate between George H.W. Bush and Ronald Reagan. Um, uh, and the, the man, as one does, <laughs> as one does, the League of Women Voters in Houston invited them. And a young man steps up and said, What would you do about the problem of illegal aliens, their children accessing public schools? So George H.W. Bush replies first and says, it's a real problem, this. And the, the way we solve it is, in a very humane and caring way, it's also good for labour, it's terrible that we're, we're criminalising these children, and these people want to work. We should end the... We have created it to be the legal immigrant. And then Ronald Reagan, he's up next. I'm expecting him to say, you know, as fellow boys, and he says, this is crazy. He says, so much unemployment in Mexico. We need work. It, it, there were people, he laughed saying it, who were suggesting we should build a fence for Mexico. He's laughing, saying it's a ridiculous thing. We need an open borders if people go back and forward. So, oh, well, we yeah, so that's only 1980, that's only 1980, right? Uh, and as, as Reese Jones and his, his work has shown, we have this, this sort of nativization um, arguments coming out of California, etc., cetera, uh, really, it's driven by racism, really political expediency, political expediency over economics. But it's only in living memory that what you mean, the arguments you say would work that's fun by leading right new thinkers. So, Kristen, how do we get back to that? Peter um, was next, and I should tell you already that you know the first two commentators uh, come working in a second philosophy and economics. So, you know, uh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not a warning, but you know, it doesn't, you know, it puts, you know, a little bit our fellows in the perspective here. Right? So, th thanks for your talk. Two, two questions. One is, is about the ethics of, of open borders. So, um, I agree with your sketch of uh, kind of philosophy on the issue that a lot of it has actually made the case for open borders. I particularly think of one article about John Good who basically says, Whoever you are, utilitarian, libertarian, liberal, you know, here's the case for open borders. Uh, so one one article that I used to teach uh, my students on this issue is an article by Leah uh, who was born in uh, Albania, called Justice and Migration. And she she kind of complicates the issue, and maybe also a standard prevention in the following sense. She says, um, look, when you, the, she starts from the observation that the fundamental problem is unequal distribution of economic value. So what motivates people, if we abstract, abstract from political refugees, what motivates people to move is economic advantage. Right? And so she says, when you then open borders to some extent, two problems arise, one in immigration and one in immigration. Right? So here's the problem in immigration. Countries like Canada will say, well, we're not going to let in anyone. So if we go away from the, the absolute open borders, but open borders a bit more, right? So who are, who are, who's going to be let in my country like Canada, Australia? Well, those who are well qualified, who will fit into the workforce, uh, mm -hmm. who will not, uh, uh, you know, and, and so, uh, because if we let in people who actually need to move from an economic perspective, uh, that would put them into competition with the poorest segments of the Canadian population. Uh, so there, there is a, 
uh, there's a, an injustice in, 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 in immigration in that sense, but there's also an injustice in emigration. If those people leave the poorer countries, they leave a gaping hole in the functioning of those societies, right? Uh, Canada sends whole recruiting teams to uh, African countries and to the Philippines uh, uh, to recruit 50% of doctors and nurses in hospitals. They're just leaking one day to the next. Mm -hmm. Those places are not functional again. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think, you know, short of just opening everything and letting everyone go where they want, which I think also is quite an unpredictable scenario, uh, I think we have to engage with these dynamics, okay, what would actually happen, who would be allowed to move, and who has a justice claim against that particular thing. So that's the first question, the second one is much shorter, uh, and you know, I'll, I'll put it under the strategic umbrella as, as standard too. Um, Historically, religion has played a huge role in politics. So to present your argument as couched in Christian anarchism, to me, sounds like a non-starter. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, uh, on the second one, uh, I, I have a book on my show which rejoices in the title Why God Hates Open Borders, published by some pastor in the US. Uh, to say, yeah, so, uh, Clearly, much of my argument is against, is against other Christian thinkers. Um, so, you know, I, I, the previous book I wrote was a book, A Defense of Pacifism, from, um, from conservative Protestant theological perspectives. It's an uphill argument, uh, but I think the argument can be won. Um, so, no, I wouldn't disagree with that. But on the first point, I mean, I, I wonder what you would reply to that question about the brain brain. I you got to. Yes, no. Uh, I, see you, I can see your eyebrows moving in between no, no, several months. No, no, no. This isn't a legal claim, uh, with all due respect to, to, the, to the person who wrote this paper. This isn't a legal claim. I think philosophers are very bad at making legal claims from their own chair. Right. But, uh, there is there is definitely evidence that the, 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 so the perspective of the, possi the, the possibility to any criticism from a poor country actually incentivizes on education. So a lot more people are getting university education because they think, oh, you know, maybe I will be able to emigrate to Canada or something. But in the end, those people actually say, even those who are, I can agree with that. It's a good move, by the way, to pick so, up. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. hospital in yeah. the Philippines, right? We yeah. send people there from yeah. you know, one day to the next, half the doctors and half the nurses are gone. Yeah, but you send by so people to take medical degrees, and a lot of these people are having to stay in here. Whereas if you close borders, if you cannot kind of settle your days to them, there's no way you'll be able to work in Canada unless people are going to come in. This is not yeah. a case for yeah. closed borders. This right. is the case for economic, yeah, don't, don't get me wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Closed yeah. borders, yeah. This is a case for equalizing access to economic advantage. Yeah. And that's that's what the under the problem is. Yeah. The counter argument, of course, is that Philippines will actually create schools just to generate nurses so that they go abroad and send um, a remittance payments back. Um, yeah. And that is an, an interesting twist on the medical yeah. that we should not forget. Also, you know, we've got the health you know, like basically if they come here, that means they, you know, if you're like a very hardcore sort of like economic analysis, you know, if they come here, that means they, they pay more, that means they work is value more, and so they want to here because of value here. Yeah. But that's not that my argument, that's kind of like very baseline sort of like economic efficiencies style of okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to come back to the, the, the argument uh, about the you know, um divisiveness and of religion and you know its historic contribution to you know boring and uh and, you know so, so because here's here's the counter argument that religion could provide uh, a framework for you know, overcoming these yes i i, I think really uh, Nearly as in any discipline, there are a, a, a range of different schools of thought. Uh, I, I would locate myself much more within the sort of historical Mennonite, Peace Church, uh, pacifist type traditions, which I think are more authentic readings of the biblical text. And so I have a lot of people to argue with a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so let me see how I want to keep order. So, so by this first, Martin, uh, okay. Uh, thanks. i uh, very, very much for this uh, kind of uh, exploration. Is you know here we sit, of course, in in, uh, in Canada, in Victoria. Interesting name for a city, uh, which is very much a product of settler colonialism. Um, the, the, I was 
struck by your in introducing, you know, your talk. You talked about how borders are, uh, you know, becoming, you know, more politicized, and and the uh, entry and exit is, is more uh, political. Um, I work with a, a a global consortium of 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 people who work on knowledge democracy, and mostly in the global south. And we, in the last four or five years, we are coming to a, the realization that there is no single place where we can meet because visa, the visa situation has become the instrument by which movement is controlled, has become so, so tight that either there's no place to get a visa or nobody from Africa, particularly Africa, can come to country X. We can't meet. We can't meet, and this is we're just small. So you you know you, when you think about uh, you know global social movements and the you know the need once in a while for people to see each other to share the stories and strategies. So this this problem, this border problem, is is impeding um, uh, you know, impeding the you know the strengthening of of the global movements we need in order to <laughs> get rid of the borders. Or to build a better, you know, kind of just world and sustain it. What do we do? <laughs> so I, I remember that uh, when I was doing my PhD, I, I, I met an elderly man called Volker Heiner. He was a physicist in Cambridge, and he'd been involved in the East-West peace movement in the Cold War. He was again sort of Mennonite type, Quaker background, and he would describe he would be going to Eastern Europe. And they would be meeting dissidents and religious leaders and scientists, and they would be coming back to the West. He said, everyone hated them. Yeah, the Western intelligence services thought we were Soviet spies, and the Soviet <laughs> thought we were all Western spies. Um, and it's so easy to dismiss these people, easy to dismiss these people. But um, and this is something that Simon, Simon's written about. Um, when uh, Gorbachev came to power, up until then, Soviet military planning had always believed a war with the West was inevitable. A conventional war, a nuclear war, a conventional war, it's always inevitable. And then, and then there were a group of people around Gorbachev, uh, Georgi Arbatov and others, who'd be part of these circles. And they were influenced this idea, maybe we could coexist. And this informed Gorbachev's uh, policy of um, nuclear weapons reduction treaties and of saving the Eastern European states we no longer going to be. Because he came to the conclusion that the capitalist and communist world could coexist. And so, you know, if you'd asked him in the 60s when there was a group of sort of nutters as they were depicted meeting in Prague or Berlin or whatever, are you going to do anything? It would be easy to dismiss that, okay? But, but ideas have legs, right? They, they leave seminars and they change the world. So I think it's important to keep promoting these ideas. And who knows what change the groups of people like yourself can make in the long run. So I have Mark and Simon, Mac and then myself. So uh, Mark and yeah, I found this whole discussion absolutely fascinating because I come from the outside. We have no discourse here. Um, so I'm, I'm working in community in the area of heritage. Heritage should never be confused with history. Right? So history happened, heritage is what we make with it. So with a network of about 200 informed people, We've been investigating the feasibility of nominating Victoria for World Heritage Site status. Hey, so you were mentioning earlier. Yeah. Know. And what did World Heritage moved in its interests and, and discourse, and now much more interested in what they call dynamic common sites rather than the global sites. Really, one of the reasons it is. Because it's enabled them to focus on the big issues of the day, and the biggest one is migrations. So we've sent out a kind of soft invitation to the world to look at sites that show evidence of migrations and how migrations have impacted positively, and the, the lessons that can be learned. So that's become a kind of a subject of investigation, which we've been pursuing you know various degrees of um success 
And, and so here, funnily enough, here's the issue. At the moment, at the moment, in the community discourse, very, very difficult to talk about migrations because, and that's one of your points, the damage done to indigenous communities. And it's really, it's, it's suppressed discussion. I find it everywhere and all the time. And not only that, it surfaces in things like, for instance, if you got the paper yesterday or the day before, say council wants to get rid of the piece of public art that stands in the middle of Centennial Square. Uh, it's, it's a fountain with three monoliths with some uh, graphic designs that talk about the morality of, of um, um, civic culture. And no one has said this to the point that Adam and this thing has to go. But talking to people you know, around them, this, it's a symbol of colonialism. See? And Victoria, in the political you know, discourse such as it is, it's extremely embarrassing. You want to get rid of all the symbols that sort of bring this to the surface, as I think. So I really have a question, but but it's an indication <laughs> that so what you're talking about is a um, it's in the world. It's a topic of discussion and exploration. And at the cutting edge that very discussion is suppressed. I don't know if you have a, I an do, observation. No, I, shall, I shall take that as a comment, but I, I wonder if there may be people here who know this debate better who've got an observation in response to Martin Romma. I'll take, I'll take that as a comment and reflect on it, actually. Yeah. The question is, is it a bubble? Is it this is core of jazz within Victoria and BC, or do you observe it also, you know, in, in the various topics around the world? Uh, um, so it's uh, it's obviously been very in, in Central Asia. It's, the, the question has been a different one. It's been about what we do with the Soviet era commemorations. It's the whole of Soviet, the Soviet Union. Uh, how do you? Uh, what do you do with all the statues of Lenin, or Pushkin, or Tolstoy, or Pushkin over the head everywhere? Uh, and different countries are handled differently. Uzbekistan erased, attempted to erase all of the statues of Lenin, every sort of visible demonstration of Russianness in public space. Pakistan had what I think was, was, a, 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 was a more measured response that, that is recognized in the history. So, in the city of where I work, on the border city of Osh, the main street was called Lenin Street, that they Redesignated the main street, Korban Jandaka, a, a local female political leader, and Lenin Street was relegated to the second street. So it's like saying we're going to keep the recognition of this colonial past, but we're going to actually, um, we're going to, we're not going to deny its existence, but we're going to put it in the second place. Uh, and of course, this is one of the issues in the, in the, in the tension between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, after the Euro Maidan protests, this uh, fierce um, this removal of, of, of Russian era statues across Ukraine and their replacement with often nationalist iconography from the 1930s and 40s of characters who you know, Israel has regarded as, as Nazi. Uh, and so this is so, you know, it's a really live issue in different places too. Uh, and it's part of part of and the tensions are meant to that war. So what, what, what do we do about the past? Um, you can't erase it, um, but the way you can choose to deal with it can, can alienate different groups of communities. So we, we only have 15 minutes left and quite some people on my list, including Emmanuel online, but some in the next. Nick, um, 
<clears throat> the wine that I will pass my syphilis test. I was able to get a Canadian student visa many years ago. <laughs> um, and get, get, get on an aeroplane um, to Canada where I was actually living for Popkin on the plane coming here. So <laughs> this resonates with my life. <laughs> 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 Um, but uh, the larger the, the larger uh, question, um, listening to you carefully, um, raises the the issue of how does the Christian anarchist formulations that are using your arguments differ from the more general secular arguments about human rights? Because it seems to me that much of what you are arguing about in terms of good um, and the moral is actually encapsulated in the international discussions about human rights. And that would certainly seem to, to fit with much of the, um, the, the migration discussion that, that you highlighted. So some thoughts on the philosophical or conceptual links, parallels, differences between the human rights regime and your formulation of, of the Christian anarchist. I think there are, there are certain there, there are certain, uh, certain, certain, certain overlaps, um, one that, uh, and that an argument can be made that human rights have their origins to an extent in Christian thinking about the nature of being human. So I think there's similar sorts of backgrounds. Um, I think one of the differences is then what becomes a right. Is there a human right? Is there a human right not to be arbitrarily arrested and killed? Possibly. Is there a human right to work? Is there a human right to go and live wherever you like? And so uh, Teresa, Teresa Hayter would, would argue that um, yeah. th there's a right to choose to live wherever you want on earth. Is that the right? So, so you, is, is that the right that we would all agree with or not? So um, the, the issue then I think becomes how do we delineate what, what is actually a right when it comes to migration, uh, but also what are the origins of that? Uh, and it's again, I think the argument was making the end. If we believe that humans have, uh, we're simply animals, we've simply evolved in the state of any other animal, why are we so presumptuous to assume that we have some inherent rights for migration that um, that others don't necessarily have? So I think there's a, there's a debate we have there. And I think that the uh, theological argument actually answers that best. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I just have a question for clarity. I also heard, um, see the, the train this kind of um, patriotism and nationalism coming around. Even Brexit is an example of recently yes. Brexit, yeah, or by American or Mac American rights against. Right? So how how could you see that train and your argument? I mean, how it is uh, contextualized? Um, you know, how it does to go in hand with the train of nationalism or patriotism? Uh, I think that uh, that nationalism, I, I think that um, here again, I find William Cabana's arguments on migrations of the holy very interesting. That this idea that we live in a secular age, he would dispute that. He would say we've actually moved the holy from worship of God to worship in the state. I think mean, you can see a lot of historical arguments for that. There's, it, it, that humans, we, we tend to worship. So there's an American novelist, uh, David Wallace Foster, I don't know if you've come across him, he was a very well-known novelist, an atheist, and he gave a famous graduation speech, commencement at Kenyon College. And he, he said this, he said, in the in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there's no such thing as atheism, everyone worships. And the question is, what do you worship? If you worship your intelligence, you'll always be worried that you'll be <laughs> something you're going to find out is stupid. If you worry your good looks and your sexual law, you're going to die a million deaths because you're aging before they find you happy. <laughs> if you worship <laughs> money, if you worship money, um, you're always not going to worry about whether you've got enough. If you worship power, you're always going to be flattened to someone's back to the But he said, he said that the choice is not. We all we worship as human beings. So the question is, what do we worship? And he said, he's an atheist. A very good reason for worshiping Jesus or Jehovah or the Wicca Mother or something else is that anything else you worship will eat you up alive. And I think that worshiping the state, what we've seen is migration to the Holy the state has been um, hugely destructive of human society. 
uh, and that we, we need to move away from that. Uh, and I think worship with God is a much better, my argument is that worship with God is a much better way to do that because you are not, uh, um, it's less disruptive. It makes all this, you know, from these very big questions to the mundane question of political scientists, because you know, you're picking up on Max's point, you know, we live in a world in which we have, you call it the worship of worshiping of borders and sovereignty, right? And, and, the, and the highly politicized debate about borders and the migration. And remember, again, yeah, that's not as sophisticated as Strider, but you know, more leftist friend <laughs> after maybe two beers, you know, you would spend when you get open borders, you know, open the borders, you have fascism in two beers in Europe. So I'm just wondering, right? You know, given the, the circuit, the context in which we live and how negatively connotated migration is and how it's being politicized by particular actors, right, on the right, very effectively so. If we advocate open borders, right, don't we, in a way, um, provide the ammunition, you know, for their kind of agenda, right? Uh, that um, that all these scenarios of, of of fear of of being threatened, right? Yeah, so I think one by one you can try to debunk those, but but it, at the moment there is this heightened sense of politicized notion of the border, right? And if you then advocate for open borders in the political discourse, right? In, Competitive party politics, you might get a very adverse effect than what you hope to achieve. You're right, and this is the point uh, that Sam is it made yes. earlier. Right. Uh, and I think that the, um, the response to hate speech is love speech, the response to incorrect speech is correct speech, the response to bad speech is good speech, and the arguments need to be won. I think, yeah, yeah, as the, as the uh, 1980 presidential debate between. Um, primary debate between Reagan and Bush. It's in living memory that leading right-wing thinkers in our states were advocating essentially open borders for migration. Um, you, you can use examples to demonstrate. So the, so the EU's, I, I, I'm not a fan of the EU, who is fine to speak external borders, but um, one of the arguments that was made against Spain, Greece, Portugal entering, was that you have huge numbers of uh, or Spaniards and Greeks and Portuguese moving to Denmark, whatever, so they could enjoy their um, generous old age pensions. You know, most people don't want to move, right? This is a truth. Most people don't want to move. They live in the communities they live in. The people who move are active, young, fit, ambitious. Uh, and so I, I think we can, we can demonstrate historically that where those types of border regimes have been in existence, if you haven't led these vast movements, uh, and those arguments are things that can and should be won. We have three numbers. What about we collect those last three sets and then you can pick the easiest one to answer? Emmanuel <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, first. Um, uh, thanks for joining us from Europe, Emmanuel. Uh, uh, Are there tensions between increased free trade and open markets, the closure of borders to human mobility, mobility that is increasingly politicized, where ideas of border countries merge because locale brings face to face a sacred. And the responsibility. Um, so that's you know just keep this in mind. So on the same line of politicizing borders in different ways. Um, Jules, yeah, uh, I'm going to make it short because I think we're running out of time. Uh, in your case, um, against uh, in favor of uh, closing the border to bad behavior against uh, smoking and drug trafficking and sex trafficking, um, I think might be important or interesting to think about how the criminalization of smuggling, trafficking, and so on have resulted in the overly violent regime against racialist people, people coming from the, the former colonies, uh, gender-based violence, because once you're divided, it's easier to make you likely to um, be excluded, and so on. And so I wonder how can we address that in your case for closing the border to bad behavior. And thinking in that, that I, I'm coming also from an anarchist tradition that think solidarity means attack, meaning if the innocent deserves solidarity, the guilty one deserves it even more. Uh, but if we focus on the innocent also, uh, border control results in uh, criminalizing solidarity. Um, and uh, so how do we how do we manage this in a, in a closed border uh, argument? The last cousin. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. I, the things that you said about um, the um, people being in the mirror of God and uh, having a 
more theological approach than um, the border issue. Made me think of uh, how uh, the Turkish president Erdogan always said that he loves the creature because of the creator could refer to people. So there is a, a, always a reference there to theology right. and uh, the Turkish, uh, the Turkish uh, government also um, um, it's also um, um, praised itself for the open, open borders to migrants coming from Mary and he uh, vindicates his uh, moral superiority with uh, refers to the EU, etc. So I wonder, um, given how this is an example of how uh, things can be uh, hijacked by certain politicians, so even the theoretical approach to um, mass. What would you uh, think um, it would be good to avoid this kind of major thing that we wish this, even considering the possibility of the So, um, wait, wait, what was that? Yeah, we... yeah, I mean, one of the things on Emmanuel's question, one of the things that I, I'm, I'm struggling to get my head around in the literature is that a lot of the economic arguments for, um, for open borders are free market, libertarian. You, know, you trust the market, it will sort this out. But Gizek would argue differently, and uh, Parsha Walia, who is, I believe she's in British Columbia, right? she's an uh, advocate of open borders, she said the whole problem is the capitalist system. And that if you open borders without dismantling global capitalism, you will have the sort of problems uh, that Emmanuel uh, references. So I think, uh, yeah, I'm still trying to get my head around that. Uh, I, I think that um, there is a tension there, uh, and that I suspect that uh, Zizek and Walia might well be right to a certain degree. I don't know how to get my head around that actually. Um, just for your question, sorry, tools. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, I didn't catch your name. Yeah, just for your question. Yeah, so that there are legitimate debates to be had in societies about whether in Canada whether cannabis is legalized or not, right? Which is not in Britain, it is in Canada, or not or decriminalized. Um, same with, with sex work. These are legitimate debates to be had. Uh, and what you've said there uh, will make me rethink uh, as I come to write this up and uh, to reference that. So thank you for the um thank you for the, the comment there. In terms of so your name was Asma. Basler. In terms of your question, um, I think, so politically speaking, the great thing about God is people can claim all sorts of things in his name and, <laughs> and not have the source to get at. Um, uh, and so, uh, and so I, I would, I would, I would agree um, that bad theology is uh, is a cause of great suffering on the earth. However, um, one could argue as well that bad politics is a cause of great suffering. The argument then, of course, is let's try and do politics better. It's not supposed to be let's, let's try and do theology better. I'll make a good last word. Nick, you definitely got us thinking and talking. We very much look forward to continuing this conversation. I'm here for a couple of weeks. Right, yes. uh, and, and I would, my diary is open. Uh, I don't want to spend every day watching old presidential primary debate. <laughs> I would love it if people want to meet up for a coffee or lunch or something. I really enjoy that. That's great. I think you can't compete with these old debates. That's great. Thank you very much.